Okay, um, so my name's Alexia Farnett and I am a senior talent manager. So basically what that is, is I do a lot with HR and a lot with recruiting. So my background actually started out right after college as a tech recruiter for an agency. Um, and then since then I've done um, a lot in the full HR space as far as being an HR manager um, and I do consulting work. So I have a master's in HR and my PHR and SHRM CP certifications. Uh, how much of your how much of your certifications and your background fit into what you do now as a recruiter? Is it all pretty much the same, or is it a little different? Yeah, it, it varies scenario by scenario. So um, the number of clients that we serve and their needs and that kind of stuff all that varies on what they're looking for. So sometimes I do um, really specific niche positions that other firms can't necessarily fill. A lot of times it's based on relationships. So. The certifications are more for the HR piece of things where I do a lot of advising on best practices, which includes recruiting best practices. And then as far as clients go, not only when they recruit people, but also how to keep them long term. So that's just as important, right, as the culture of the company that you're going to work for. Uh, when a company is looking for an applicant, are they generally more specific about the candidate's background or more generalized? That's a really good question. So it depends on the position. So if I'm looking for an entry level receptionist, um, or a temp position, generally they're a lot less specific. Um, but when we're start talking about you know developers or really senior level positions, they start to get more and more specific. And it depends on the company's culture. So if you um, have a lot of accounting clients, you're gonna want somebody with that accounting background because you need to be able to not only do what you do, but in the scope of whatever your clients do. So a lot of times it just varies position by position. I would say more often than not, most clients have we start out with a really specific definition, and as we move through the interview process, that changes. So I thought I wanted A, B, C, D, and they were all must-haves, and as I'm interviewing these people with these things, I'm kind of starting to change because that doesn't necessarily always impact what they're doing. So a lot of times we're advising our clients as far as, you know, interview these three people first and let's get a gauge on if you're looking for the right things for this role, because sometimes they're trying to backfill something and they're trying to mirror that person instead of mirror what that person needs to do in that role. Uh, is being overly specific sometimes a problem when searching for the ideal fit? Yes, definitely. So you don't want to be too generic. You don't want to just take any you know, person off the street, but sometimes you can kind of pigeonhole yourself into this, this really specific search and overlook people that may be a better fit. So title is a really good example. Um, I don't want to see anybody that had this kind of title. Well, that titles don't really specify what you do. So I could be an ambassador or an evangelist or whatever, you know, but I can have the skill set that you need. So, you know, having some flexibility, knowing that that may change and just because the person you hired before had this background, it doesn't always mean that the person that you hire next needs to have that background, if that makes sense. How much are companies usually willing to flex to get the person they want? Depends. So some of it depends on budget. So if I, you know, if I really want these 10 things and I'm only willing to pay 60 grand, but it's an 80, $90,000 a year roll, something has to give. You're not gonna find you know, a purple squirrel for 30, I always joke that everybody wants a NASA engineer for $30,000 and there's just no such thing. So it depends. And a lot of it, it depends on who they're working with and what the results are that they're seeing. So some of it is based on, um, we give some candidates without salary information to get a baseline for what their threshold is. Um, and then we show them this, if this is what you're looking for, this is what the market's saying that these people should be paid. What are you willing to give up? Or you're interviewing people, you said you only want Ivy League degrees. Does that really matter? We have somebody without an Ivy League degree, but their their experience is incredible and they really have had a lot of success. So it really just depends on the culture of the organization, which a lot of things do. How often are you seeing that uh, degrees are not as meaningful as experiences? I'd say it's a 50-50 split. So having a, a bachelor's degree is, is more important than having a bachelor's degree in, if that makes sense, when we come down to having a bachelor's degree. And of course, that's never gonna be true for a doctor or an accountant. You have to have degrees in those <laughs> fields. But um, I think a lot of companies have this, this preconceived notion that a bachelor's degree is is the best thing that you can have and there's some benefits to it it shows that you have the stick you know the stick to itiveness and all those types of things that are required to get a four-year degree but um i think a lot of times especially in fields like sales where it's not necessarily as much of a requirement you see a lot more flexibility with it where 
you have this person with incredible experience that can really back up that they can do what they're doing that may not have a degree not as challenging as if you're looking for somebody entry level that they want a degree because theoretically that degree gave them some experience so um i would say it it depends on the culture of the company um i think now people are starting to give a little bit more flexibility to it because the market's kind of oversaturated with you know some of those online university degrees that maybe either got themselves a bad name or they got somebody from there that gave them and put the bad taste in their mouth so it just depends of the past like five to ten positions that you filled how many of them hit all of those qualifications that the company was looking for uh none and i would say in the 15-ish years that i've been working in this arena i've maybe seen it hit once where they get their entire wish list fulfilled and a lot of times that's why you build a wish list we really encourage people to need to have absolutely no you know no arguing about this nice to have and then prioritize the nice to have if this person has these two things but not these 10 are you going to pass them up or are you going to give them a, an interview and kind of see what they're about and what's teachable and what's not you know you mm -hmm. can teach skills but you can't teach values which is something that we try to really kind of hammer in especially for for lower level entry positions HR, for example, a lot of that's on the job training. So to get into HR though, everybody wants you to have experience. If, you're, if you need experience to get in, how are you gonna get experience to get in? So it becomes one of those things where if that person has the values and the drive, HR is really kind of a, a train as you go situation. There's HR degrees, of course, and there's a lot that you can learn from it, but it's just one of those things where there's some things you can teach and some things you can't. So we try to help our clients understand what the differences between those things are. If somebody has Java and not C Sharp and they need C Sharp, can you teach them that? If they had the, the ability to learn Java, they may have that. So it's just kind of like an example, but we try to encourage a little bit more open-mindedness, especially in this economy. Uh, what should job seekers do to ensure their resumes stand out when recruiters are searching for them? It's a really good question. And I think that's probably one of the most important things people can ask. I would say definitely I'm a big proponent of LinkedIn now with the prevalence of social media, having a LinkedIn profile is, is I would say, the most popular way to source. Um, you can see people's endorsements, you can see who they follow, you can see their school and that kind of stuff. Um, and depending on the field that they're in, you know, if I'm looking for another HR person or another recruiter, if I go to their LinkedIn profile and they have 20 connections, that's a red flag. As a recruiter, you should have a lot because that's part of our field. Um, and if I don't follow any influencers in my field, that's kind of a red flag too. So I would say, definitely get on LinkedIn. Um, one of the biggest things that I think kind of is a, is a mystery is how recruiters find people. And the way that we work is we're given a job description by, by whoever. So if we're internal, it's by our hiring manager. If it's external, it's by a client. And we have to take that and generate a keyword search. So your title may be something really cool that we've never heard of before but we're searching by keywords, so we may not find you. Um, so making sure that in your resume or in your LinkedIn profile, you have really standard buzzwords written in there, um, you know, developed design, those kinds of things, so that we can find you really, really easily, make it idiot proof for us. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, a lot of times I see resumes that are just pages and pages and pages of tasks. I did, you know, AP invoicing as an accounts payable clerk. I did these things. That's great. But what did you accomplish? Did you streamline reporting? Tell me about the numbers that you were able to achieve. Tell me how many likes you were able to get on a particular Facebook campaign if it's a social media position. Tell me about what you accomplished because that's going to speak. I can Google a job description any day. That's not what I want to see. I want to see accomplishments. But you do need to have enough tasks in there so that you can hit those key buzzwords so we really understand that we found the right person and not just a lot of jargon and a lot of speak and be specific. Um, you know, as, especially as you get into your field, you kind of take for granted that people understand industry specific or, or field specific terms, get specific. Don't just say I worked on Microsoft Office, use those buzzwords. buzzwords. Don't just say I worked on, you know, Adobe, which Adobe products did you use? Because we may not know to look for Flash or Illustrator, but if you put those words in there, we'll know that that's what you worked on. Um, and I would say be honest. I've, I've, and be honest and be relevant. Um, if you haven't touched technology in, you know, five to ten years, don't put on your res don't put it on your resume, and then you know, hoping that you're going to get a hit on it because then that's going to get you to an interview process that maybe mm -hmm. isn't the most honest. So, uh, for people like me that have um, wildly different um, <laughs> experiences in yeah. the resume from 
from being part of a construction industry than of being part of the entertainment industry. Yeah. Are there things that I should trim out of my LinkedIn profile to to be more appealing? Are, are recruiters turned off when they see people that have just just bombastic experience? That's client specific, actually. So, so not necessarily. I think what kind of turns recruiters off and what turns a lot of hiring managers off is if I see a lot of jumping and mm -hmm. a lot of gaps. So if every three months you're at a new position, it's okay if it's a contract, but say, like in the title, just say this is a contract. We all understand that that's a, a completely normal type of work. Um, but if you've had 10 jobs in the last three years and they weren't contracts, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big red flag to us. But no, I would say, you know, the, the depth and breadth of your experience, you know, that's important and that kind of adds to the value you can bring. And you don't know if there's a client out there that wants construction and entertainment together because they have this thing. So I'd say if you have varied experience, leave it on there because your perfect company might be out there. Mm -hmm. And unless you have that on there, they won't know. For folks that are way more tenured in, and as you get more experience, start pulling stuff off your resume that's not as relevant, that's way far back. You know, it's it's when you're 18 and looking for a job, I mean, I put on my resume that I was a pill counter at a pharmacy, and you know, I was a camp counselor because at that point that was super relevant, but once I had enough professional experience, mm -hmm. nobody's gonna be super impressed that I was a camp counselor mm -hmm. when I was 17, so that got pulled off. So I would say, you know, for folks that are 20 plus years into their career, kind of take that same approach. Your first job or your first internship, you may be very prideful about it and definitely put it on your LinkedIn, but out of respect for recruiters who have to read a lot of resumes, maybe start pulling some of that stuff off since it may not be as immediately applicable to what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. Would it be helpful if LinkedIn were to put in to their, or to their website an area where you just turn off certain Instead of deleting them in full, yeah. because you lose a lot of that. You can't. You don't want to retype it all. But just okay. being able to turn off certain experiences. Yeah. That would probably be a huge help, just because, you know, if you've been with one company forever, you've had, God knows how many jobs, and that can start to get really long. And we're not going to scroll that long anyway. But we want to look at your your education. We want to see what else you've got going on. So, um, I would say definitely that would be a huge help. But in lieu of that, I. And I, I, sh I meant to look into this, but I think LinkedIn has like a download feature where you can almost download a resume mm -hmm. based on your profile, download it, save it to a, a Google Drive or some other cloud-based thing. So you have a record of it and then just kind of wipe it or s summarize it. Mm -hmm. That's the other piece too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what markets have been the hardest to place for? Um, I would say universally right now, it's, it's kind of equally tough across the board. I mean, Tech is starting to boom in Tampa. You're starting to see a lot more technology companies. You're starting to see a lot more need and desire for agile and stuff like that. And we don't have that, that population here. So I would say that's been really tough. Um, other than that, I think widespread low unemployment rates um, and improved economy, the best candidates at this point mostly have jobs because the unemployment rate is so incredibly low. So. But by the time we're looking, we're looking at people who are already working, which they may not be interested in, in, in finding a new job or they may love the company where they're at. So it makes it a lot harder to find good people to present for, for certain positions. Since the economy has stabilized, how do you kind of get those candidates out that you need out from the company they're with? It's a good question. And I'm going to divulge some secrets here. Um, so... <laughs> When I was an agency recruiter, um, which I'm not now, I do a very different thing. I do consulting agency. We call this open season or poaching season. So you have a lot of people who are waiting to get their year end bonuses, um, who are now going to get, make, get ready to make the leap in January. You have a lot of people who've been unhappy and made that new year's resolution to find a new job. Budgets just got approved. So a lot more positions just opened up. So this type of year, time of year is very, very busy. Um, so that's, that's the first piece is you start to get a little bit of an influx of candidates because they were just waiting for that bonus payout to be on their way. Um, but a lot of times the techniques that we use are, are, well, what I use are soft questions to probe. So somebody might think that they're happy, but they're just having a good day. So it's catching somebody when they had a bad day or it's, it's finding those pain points and really kind of exploiting them for lack of a better word. It's, 
Um, you know, if my client has a phenomenal culture and a really strong growth and development program and a lot of opportunities there, I'll kind of start pushing and putting those questions in their ear. And at, it may not work now, but they have a bad day, their manager says something, they turn down a, a growth opportunity or they don't get a promotion that they're looking for or they don't get this class that they want or they don't get something paid for they start to remember the questions that I was asking them and they'll reach back out. Um, you know, if they don't like their manager, that's, that's another thing that's usually, people don't think about that because they love the people they work with. They don't think all the time about how bad their managers until they're home on their 20th night complaining to their spouse about how much their manager sucks. So it's those little things. It's finding the strengths that your client has that maybe other companies don't and kind of sort of putting, just putting the ideas out there. A lot of popular techniques that a lot of people use is we're in Florida. This is a lovely time of year. Not so much in the Northeast and, you know, in the snow melt and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's kind of, you know, using weather as a ploy, which is not as much of a tactic in, say, July and August when it's a million degrees outside. But that's kind of, that's kind of how you, you put that bug out there. It's, it's finding what those pain points are for somebody. And you always want it to be a win-win, right? I would, if somebody's really happy, I don't want to pull them out of their of their job because for us, we work with our clients long-term. I mean, some of the clients we've had for five, 10 years because we want to make sure that it is truly a win for the candidate and truly a win for the client. So if somebody's really happy and they're doing a great, great job there, I don't want to pull them out. But if somebody has a pain point that I can solve by putting them somewhere else, I definitely want to make sure that they have all the information because a lot of people hear from a recruiter and immediately shut it down. Um, you have a lot of people who will just take any interview because it's great practice, which is also something that, you know, I think my dad passed down to me and I hear a lot of people say the same thing. It's, it's a good way to stay in practice and it's a good way to know what's out there. Um, so you, you kind of have to, to feel people out and it's, it's, we, I always try to be really respectful. If somebody says, no, I move on my way. I mean, with what I do, I get calls all the time. I'm in the industry, they're looking, they want people, and, and I always respectfully say no, and I've actually turned one of those calls around and got that person to be interested in working for us because I was able to exploit a pain point for them. Like they called me on a Saturday at like six o'clock at night. Why are you working on Saturday, six o'clock at night? That's, there's no work-life balance there, you know? So it's, that's those, it's those little strategies that I think get us the right people, and networking. That's really the biggest thing too, is um, once you, you start, it's not that whole like, it's not what you know, it's who you know. You definitely need to know what you're doing, but but having those right contacts, I may not have a position for you now, but that doesn't mean I'm not gonna have one for you in three, four years when you're ready to make a move or ready to take that next step or something like that. So networking is another really key piece um, to, to placing a lot of people. And especially once you get to know somebody's personality, you can judge if a company is gonna be the right culture for them. If you're really conservative, I'm not gonna put you in a situation where everybody wears jeans and they say curse words and you know, beer clock happens at four o'clock on Fridays. That's not gonna work for you. But if somebody's really casual, I'm not gonna put you in a buttoned up environment where they don't encourage those kinds of things. So it's networking kind of works twofold because you get to know the person and what's important to them and you can make a better judgment call because you'll know your client so well. Have there been times when you've talked to a client on the phone and you're just kind of like, I don't think I can place them anywhere just based on how they sound or their personality over the phone? You mean a candidate? Yeah. Um, once. The person was really abrasive, really, really rude, um, and very full of themselves. <laughs> and I think that's super rare. You're not going to find a ton of people who are just that obnoxious, and that was more of a judgment call for me because it's not somebody that I wanted to professionally represent. Um, more than that person's not placeable. A lot of the people that we work with, you know, personality is really important to to whatever degree. If, again, back to the conservative thing, I'm not going to put a free spirited hippie into that really conservative law firm. That's a terrible plan. That's gonna it's gonna explode and it's gonna backfire. My client's gonna think I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but this person in particular, I just, I worried about how they would be in an interview. I worried about how they treat their coworkers. You know, I worried about the phone calls that I would get and the resulting HR issues that would come out of that. So um, I think once it's, it's happened, but generally speaking, um, you know, if it's a, if it's a field we don't usually work with uh, because we tend to do very specific areas, I'm just very upfront with them and I'll refer them to, you know, I have a bunch of recruiter friends that I know personally that I trust and and know that they'll take a good a good care of that candidate so i'll refer them to a friend if i don't think i'll have anything for them but again i stay in contact and ask how they're doing every so often okay uh, when setting up a candidate for an interview what are some of the things that he or she should keep in mind the candidate yep um so for me i'm not a morning person 
grouchy, I'm tired, and, and not very smart. So <laughs> I try to avoid interviewing early in the morning because I know I'm just not at my best. Um, so from a candidate perspective, when you're scheduling an interview, a lot of times you don't have control over when you can interview, but try to bear and keep in mind what your best times of day are. When do you feel the most alert? When do you feel that you're at your best? And try to schedule interviews around those times. It may be tough for you if your company's not aware that you're looking, but you'll come off better in the interview. Um, and traffic, that's important too. So if you're, if you live, or your current job's in Clearwater, um, and your interview is in Palm Harbor, you're probably not gonna wanna go there when it's at the most traffic-y. Um, you know, you're not gonna probably wanna interview at 4 p.m. in the middle of July if you have to wear a full black suit. It's stuff like that that just, cause you're gonna come in sweaty. I mean, there's just no avoiding that, it's Florida. So I think little things like that matter. Um, and I would ask if you're, if the person you're working with doesn't tell you, how long can, can your, are they expecting to interview? A lot of times we can't say because we don't know, um, but we try to give them a ballpark, especially if I'm asking you to come in at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday, you probably wanna know if you can go back to work and you probably have to tell your employer. So we say, generally speaking, we're looking at about an hour and a half to two hours now. If your conversation goes over, we can't help that, but we try to give people a ballpark. I would also try to find out if you're gonna be asked to take any kind of testing. A lot of people do those, you know, different types of testing for different positions. Cause again, you're gonna to wanna to go when you're a little bit more sharp and a little bit more alert just based on your own personality. Uh, how should a candidate best answer the ever present question of where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> so it is definitely not one of my favorite interview questions that gets asked. Um, and it's a tricky one because, you know, it can be, you know, kind of a trap at some points. Um, I think the best way, or I think really, I think what they're trying to get out of it is, are you goal driven? So playing to that, I think the best way to answer that question is to kind of move towards, here's what my goals are and here's how I'm working towards them. I think that extra piece of here's how I'm working towards them adds a little more credibility to, I have these goals. Okay, well, well what are you doing? Um, you know, if your goal is to become a manager or a director, how are you getting there? What are you doing to better yourself? Um, rather than the expectation, I expect to be a senior director or I'd like to be a, a manager, making it more goal focused and really giving that extra push of this is how I'm doing it, I think makes you stand out a little bit more in the interview process than, well, I wanna be a manager. I'd like to drive a Ferrari, but like, what am I doing to get there? <laughs> so I think that that little extra bit generally helps like I said, I'm not a fan of that question, um, but I think that's the intent of it. Do you think there's any way to really blow that question to make your, to, if yeah. there's a position that they know that you're going to be, pretty much be stuck at, there, there's not much growth in it, will the candidate really blow it if they say that they are working towards being a manager? Or is that just going to be, that's going to show them that they're going to put forth the effort that they want, regardless if there's growth or not? Um, so that's a tricky question. So I think, um, I think that's something as a candidate you'd want to know because I don't think that that would be a good match for you, right? So I'm all mm -hmm. about that win-win. Um, so I think that's important as a candidate for you to know if it's, we're really not looking to promote this position or, or for whatever reason, we haven't seen a lot of growth trajectory and that's something that you want. I would, you know, weigh that in your mind when you're considering an offer. Um, you can blow the question, but it's more of the, I expect to be promoted to a senior director with no backup to that. The expect is kind of a tricky word and I don't encourage the use of it in interviews because that kind of gives that entitlement sense um, and that'll turn most hiring managers and recruiters right off. But I think um, if you answer the question honestly with these are my goals and this is what I'm, what I'm doing to get to them and that doesn't line up with what the employer is looking for, that's a good sign to you as the candidate that it's not the right company for you. And like I said, at this point, it's not necessarily um, with such a good economy, that's not necessarily such a bad thing because it's not like we're all desperate for jobs anywhere that'll hire us. So I would say take your time and that's a good indicator for you and, and take note of that. Uh, when asked what their weakest quality is, what should a candidate use as a response? I hate this question so much and it pains me that people use it. Um, so if you hear this question, it's a terrible interview question. Um, I mean, in all honesty, most seasoned, good hiring managers and recruiters don't use that anymore because we all know everybody just Googles how to answer it and gives them some BS answer. Can I say BS? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you get asked it and if you have to answer it, I mean, the best way to answer it is honestly, but with a positive spin. So, um, let's say you do not have good attention to detail and you know darn well that you don't, instead of just saying that or saying my, you know, biggest weakness is that I work too hard no one's taking you seriously. Um, I would, you know, if, if it is attention detail, I'd say, you know, 
I'm working on my attention to detail by doing these things. Again, giving some, some solid examples of what you're doing to improve that. So instead of it just being this weakness, it's this opportunity for growth that you're using to get yourself better because everybody has weaknesses. If you didn't, you're not human, but what are you doing about it? So I think that's kind of the best approach. And I wouldn't like come up with this laundry list of examples of all the things you're terrible at. I would, I would pick the ones that are honest, but the ones that are the easiest to kind of put that positive spin on. This is what I'm doing about this. You know, I, um, I don't, I don't even know some other ones. I've never, oh God, I haven't asked this interview question. I think since my first interview where I was told not to, <laughs> um, but it's just, I think that's the best way to answer it is you're not lying and you're not going, well, I just work too gosh darn hard. Um, it's, it's just, it's being honest, but it's, it's fixing it. How, mm. what are you doing to solve the problem? That's kind of the biggest thing. That's what employers really want is how are you solving problems? If it's someone that doesn't really, that on the spot can't think of something professionally to say, would it be all right for them to bring up something personally that they're working on to show that human side of them? Or would that kind of, would that make it an awkward interview when they're saying like, like my fingernails? Sure. <laughs> I'm trying to work on not chewing my fingers raw sure. when I'm stressed. But sure. I don't know, is that too much information in an interview to say? Or should they keep it strictly a professional item? I would say keep it professional and mm -hmm. the best way to combat being caught off guard is to be prepared to answer it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So I would, you know, I think what I used to do when I was interviewing, um, as the person being interviewed, I would Google like the most common interview questions and I would just be ready to answer them. Like ones that you can't, that one is really hard to answer off the spot. Um, so just kind of being prepared because everybody's inter interviewing nervously no matter how calm and cool collected there, I mean, you're being judged. Mm -hmm. So anybody who tells you that they're not nervous is either a professional interview or they're completely full of it. So being prepared ahead of time is I think the best way to just kind of avoid some of that. And it's okay if you forget. Um, but I, I always recommend taking a pad folio with a, pe with a pad of paper and a pen, writing questions down that you want to ask. And it's okay to put little notes to yourself, especially if you put them small so they can't see. So just, you know, reminder, this is the answer to this, or this is how I want to answer it. I think it's super rare to get asked that question nowadays because mm -hmm. most people are moving towards behavioral interviewing. Um, but just be ready. What are your greatest strengths? Same thing. I mean, you don't want to sound cocky and arrogant, but you, you want to be honest. What are, what am I really good at? Um, so just kind of doing research ahead of time and thinking about it. When being interviewed in the past, I've been told to take notes on what's being said, but I rarely see anyone actually employing that. Is that still a good tactic to use when being interviewed? Um, it depends. I mean, I've seen people do it and I think to a degree it's helpful because it shows that you're interested. I mean, certainly if you have questions written down that you want answers to, that is a really good time once you get to ask them to take notes. Um, and that's something I encourage everybody to have is, is questions prepared that show that you're interested. You don't want, want questions that are easily answered by going to their website. You want thoughtful questions, but um, taking notes on every little thing that they're saying, I don't think that that's a prudent practice because that doesn't show value and it doesn't show that you're a strategic thinker, right? Because if you're just parroting everything back, that's not that helpful mm -hmm. and you're probably not paying attention if you're having to take that detailed of notes. But if they say something that's worth noting, I would say write it down, be prepared to take notes. You know, if you want to write down, if they say something that prompts another question, write that down. Um, I just think it, it looks better to come prepared with that stuff just in case. But those are the times I think it makes the most sense. Um, when doing research before doing a job interview, Glassdoor is pretty much a go-to right now for mm -hmm. mostly truthful reviews mm -hmm. from either happy employees or most likely disgruntled employees. Right. When is a good time if you were to come across a, a company that has a specific negative trait that's mentioned in most of their reviews, when is it prudent to actually bring that up as a source of concern during an interview, if at all? It's a really, really good question. I would say also Indeed does similar things to mm -hmm. Glassdoor, so check Indeed too. And then see if you're connected to anybody on LinkedIn, current or former employees that can kind of give some insight. So a lot of times Glassdoor is really negative and it's just kind of like Yelp, right? Like if you're really, really pissed and you had a really bad experience, that person is way more likely to write a review than the person like, oh, that was just such a good job, man. That was so good. That person's probably not gonna write it, mm -hmm. you know? So. So Glassdoor is usually pretty accurate as far as airing grievances. Sometimes they're geared towards specific managers. Sometimes they're spot on. Um, outside, you know, if you reach out to a couple people on LinkedIn and you kind of find out that your concerns are validated, I would say during the second interview, bring it up really respectfully, um, knowing that, you know, either 
it's a particular situation that you don't know the ins and outs of, um, or it's a, tied to a particular person that may not be there anymore. The manager may not be aware of it because it could be in a different department. And it depends how big the company you're interviewing with. Mm -hmm. But I would say the second interview, because in the first interview, you're kind of just trying to suss out basics, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's almost kind of like dating. And I hate to say that, but you really kind of, you're still kind of feeling each other out. Is this the right company for me? Is this the right job for me? And they're doing the same thing. When you get to the second round, it's a little bit more serious and you really want to know what it's like here. So if you see that, you know, turnover is a concern, or if you see that, um, people are really disgruntled by, you know, leadership or things like that, finding a really tactful, respectful way to bring that up during the second interview is probably your best bet. And just say, hey, you know, in doing my research on Glassdoor and on Indeed, I kept coming across a common theme and I was just curious as to what your take on this was. And here's what I'm coming across. So you're not accusing because you don't know what's true and what's not. Mm -hmm. um, and there may be a perfectly good reason. They may have had a layoff and there's unfortunately nothing that you can do about that. Um, and all those people might be really angry and writing reviews, who knows? There could be merit to it, but it just being respectful, I think is your best bet because you don't know who's friends with who. And if you're rude to this interview guy, he might be best friends with the next guy you're interviewing. And so I would say respectfully, second interview is your best bet. Uh, speaking in more specific terms for bringing up something tactfully, I'll break, <laughs> break my interview status. We both work for the same company. Yes. We, we know that a, a specific company has a reputation for turnover. If if someone were to interview with that company and they see that's the running trend, what is the tactful way of bringing that up without sounding like you're trying to accuse them? How do you say, I've seen a lot of people say there's high turnover. How do you explain that? I mean, I, I don't see a tactful way, and I know people will do it mm -hmm. because there's really when you see 20 or so reviews that say this very specific thing, it's hard to ignore. It is. And it's a, it's very concerning if you're mm -hmm. coming in there, you don't want to, you don't want to be part of that turnover. Right. I mean, how do you do that without making them sound like you're right. just being a self-righteous dick? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good question. And I think this is important, right? Is, is, mm -hmm. is learning tactful ways to get the information you want. So I think, Research is key, right? So if you can, if it's not just, I've heard this through the grapevine, not helpful. Hey, while doing my research on Glassdoor and on Indeed and in talking to people that used to work here, this is something that I'm hearing is, is, a, is a consistent theme. I'm hearing that there's a lot of high turnover and I'm curious as to what you're doing to address that. I'm curious as to how you guys are working through that and correcting that issue. So giving them the benefit of the doubt instead of that, the hell's your issue? Mm -hmm. um, is a, and I think coming at it from a truly, truly questioning place rather than a, you know, what's your problem place mm -hmm. puts you in a better stance and also respect the person that you may be interviewing with may not know mm -hmm. that a lot of times that's, that's how it's at much, much higher levels. You could be talking to somebody again, if, if it's department specific or region specific, depending on how big that company is, you can be interviewing with somebody who doesn't know. So understanding that and I don't know may very well be truthful. Sometimes it's BS, sometimes it's not. You'll have to use your own judgment. But that's kind of, I think, the best tried and true way to approach anything sensitive. Mm -hmm. Hey, I heard you guys just went through a round of layoffs. I'm a little bit trepidatious about moving forward in the interview process. Can you tell me a little bit more about the situation that led to that? Or is that something that you can't talk about? And then respecting their answer. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important information to have. And I think it's, as a candidate, something you have to weigh. If you hear that turnover is an issue and they have a really great way that they're addressing it, that's, if you're comfortable with that answer, that's a great way to move forward. There's, you know, I think a lot more tools now for companies to see turnover and to understand the causes of it and how to address it. So there's a lot of companies that are very proactively working on it that they may not have been aware it existed before. Cause I think, you know, from a, from an HR perspective, big data is just starting to become one of those buzzwords for us and more HR people are starting to get data smart. Whereas in the past, a lot of times only bigger companies had that because you had your core HR team and because HR doesn't produce revenue, it was tough to get an analyst in there who could look at that data and give you something meaningful. And without that data, it's really hard to know how to fix it. So from an HR person's perspective, until you're aware there's a problem, it's really tough to know how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And until you're aware of what's causing it, it's really hard to know how to fix it. So now that there's more tools for analytics, more companies are starting to be aware. And with Glassdoor, 
things may surface that the senior leadership team didn't know about because it's kept at lower levels. So, you know, with social media and like the, the kind of Yelp culture of if I'm not happy, I'm going to put it out there. I think more companies are starting to kind of get a little bit um, more proactive about those kind of things. So making sure you're asking what they're doing about it. How are they working through that? Were they aware of it? You know, is this something that they, you know, have seen before or had, had heard of? So, and then respecting the mm -hmm. answer, because I've been yelled at during an interview and I didn't know an answer. And it was, I mean, that's an immediate, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, have you ever had to quell any of those concerns before sending someone on an interview? Um, let me think. Not recently. Um, we did have, um, I did have way back in the day, so this is my very first uh, recruiting job right out of college. We did have a, a client that was had a little bit of a, a bad reputation for the same reason. Um, and it wasn't as much quelling as it was me asking the my client contact about the rumor because since I was an agency recruiter, I really didn't know. Um, and the candidate had a friend that worked there before. So not really. Um, and, and as an external party from the recruiting side, I'm not an internal person. I can't oftentimes answer a lot of those really specific mm -hmm. questions unless it's a, can't, it's a client that we're working with in that capacity. If it's a client we're working with on a known turnover issue, I'll proactively address it with the candidate. We know these are issues and we're working on them. Here's what we're doing from like a broad scope perspective, just so that they're aware so they don't hear murmurings or mm -hmm. get the information secondhand. So I kind of like to be a little more proactive with those things. Because again, if you're not comfortable with that, I don't want you to work here. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to make a jump because it's, it's your family security, it's your income. If you're not happy, you're not gonna like me in six months because I'm the <laughs> one that put you there. And neither is my client because mm -hmm. I have to start back over, so mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, what are some of the biggest mistakes that candidates make during an interview besides answering those two <laughs> previous questions incorrectly? Um, I think coming unprepared or coming underprepared is, is the most common. So you should treat a job interview like a test. You should study for it. You should be prepared for it. You should research it. Um, if you ask a question, like I said before, that's easily found by Googling or going to their web page, you're going to sound like you don't know what you're doing. So I think it's really important to understand how the company makes money or what they do as a broad function. Um, get a general gist of who their executives are. I mean, I'm, I, I wouldn't say go as far as know what their school is, but try to get, if they have pictures on the website and names, try to at least have that down. Um, you know, if they're publicly traded, I would know about what their stock price is, um, unless you're in finance and then you better know darn well what it opened out of that day. Um, I think those are really big things. Um, having copies of your resume on unwrinkled paper, having a pad folio with a paper and pen that works. Mm -hmm. um, just ways to show that you're kind of thinking ahead and prepared. Um, dressing appropriately for the culture you're in. I would say always err on the side of conservative, being conservative if you're not sure, but it is never okay to show up in jeans if you don't know what the dress code is. Um, being cocky, I think, is one thing that really can turn you off, and I think and I think it comes from a product of being nervous, and I think that's how some people overcome it, but it comes across the hiring managers like, excuse me, who do you think you are? Uh, but you should be confident, but cocky in it, and not cocky, and that's, I think that's a fine line. But I think those are um, some of the biggest ones. I think with the, the younger generation, one of the things they see is using way too much text speak and slang during an interview. It's still a formal process, and you should still be on kind of your best behavior. Mm -hmm. And then to that effect, overly bashing or bad mouthing your former employer, your former boss, your former coworkers, no matter how bad it was, that is gonna leave such a sour taste in the mouth of the hiring manager. So save that stuff for water cooler talk after the fact. But um, you know, if your last employer was a complete tyrant, there are positive, respectful ways to say that, you know, I'm really looking for a growth opportunity and I just felt like I'd kind of gotten to the top of, of where I was going to be there. Or I really wanted, you know, a chance at management level and that's not something that was being offered there. <laughs> <laughs> um, things like that. So taking those, again, taking those super negative things and making them a little bit more positive and constructive. Um, I can't tell you how many times the candidates just went on and on about my boss was such a raging blah, blah, blah. And it just, it completely turns you off because you don't know that person's boss. Mm -hmm. There's no way to validate it. You're like, well, I don't want them to. Uh, I don't want them to say that about me. So mm -hmm. now I'm a little bit hesitant to hire you. And that's not very professional. This is the first time I'm meeting you, mm -hmm. so it doesn't leave the best impression. So I'd say those are the 
more common more common ones lying on the resume is pretty rare um that's a huge no-no because we'll find out and it's just not good for you but i think those the underprepared i think is the number one thing i see is people don't take it seriously they they don't map the location so they don't know how long it takes them to get there at any given point in the day during traffic and then they come late mm -hmm. um being late is a big no-no being too early is also a big no-no i would say 15 10 minutes early you're fine anything more than that you're really hang out in your car yeah drive around the block a couple times <laughs> um but yeah that's i would say those are the the biggest no-nos on some interviews that i've been on when they look at uh like my school since my school is a physical and an online school mm -hmm. they don't seem to take it as seriously they seem i've gotten some smarmy responses sure in the past when someone questions the the validity of your your academic achievements what's kind of the best way to uh to to rebuff that sure to, to try to validate your own experience sure well i would say first of all i would have concerns about an employer that's willing to blatantly disrespect your education in an interview process. So maybe consider that when you're deciding if you want to work there. Um, but I mean, if it's an accredited institution, it mm -hmm. speaks for itself. So um, I would turn the focus more to your experience and how your coursework prepares you for that. So, you know, if it's, um, you know, University of Phoenix, I think is one of them that's that's still accredited. I can't remember which one lost accreditation recently, but- um, Eckerd College. Is that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, I would just say, hey, my, you know, it's an accredited institution and I just want to make sure that you're aware of that. And then secondly, you know, here's how the courses that I took here, here and here helped prepare me for this experience. And this is how I've applied that to what I can do. And it depends how far out of college you are. I mean, at a certain point or how far past your degree you are at a certain point, it's not that relevant. My degree is in international economics with a minor in Italian. <laughs> Nothing to do with what I do now. So it really isn't that relevant. So as you get farther and farther away from that, I think that should get challenged less and less. Um, and again, if, if they're willing to be kind of that disrespectful in an interview, you may have second thoughts on if you want to work for them. Mm -hmm. um, but if they ask legitimate questions, I would just tie that to experience and how it prepared you um, and then focus on your experience because that's really going to be the driver of if you can do your job or not. I mean, I was a, recru a recruiter 15 years ago and that prepared me to some degree for what I do now, but that's not as relevant as my job you know four years ago so let's talk about that we mm -hmm. don't need to talk about my international economics degree because that didn't do anything for me in the <laughs> professional realm so that's how i would i would try to get them to focus on the experience uh occasionally you run into interviewers that are kind of kind of rough around the edges mm -hmm. um on one occasion i was uh, flat out insulted by one sure just because i was applying for a very entry-level position and he was asking me advanced level questions it was getting very frustrated but she said are you incompetent at what point should an interviewee just stop the interview when it becomes that abrasive and just say no more or this this is not working out if you feel yourself and that's that's terrible and i would hope that those experiences are are incredibly minimal mm -hmm. um but if you get to a point where you're either physically uncomfortable if they're encroaching on your personal space or if they've been harassing or made derogatory remarks or you get to a point where you feel like you can't control your emotions mm -hmm. um you know i wouldn't interrupt what they're saying but i would wait for a break and say thank you so much for your time i think at this point i have all the information i need to make my decision and i'm, I'm going to move on with my job search be polite be respectful you never want to be the person that's on the receiving end of that if you can't say it in front of your grandma don't say it in an interview mm -hmm. um you know, but I think that's how I would approach it. I mean, I've never really been in that situation where somebody's just been so rude. I was just like, I can't take this anymore. Um, I mean, thanks to them kind of for, for showing you that you don't need to waste your time any further. Mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of how I do it. I'd wait for a break in the conversation or wait until they ask a question and say, hey, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you taking your time out of your day, but I don't think that this is the best position for me. I don't think this is the best company for me. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and excuse myself from the interview. Something like that. And have... You know, if you're not comfortable coming on the spot with language like that, have it prepared, have it just like the weaknesses question, mm -hmm. have it written on your little pad that's something you can refer to, practice it in case you need to use it, and hopefully you never do, but that way you're never caught off guard and you're not going to lose your temper and, and kind of shout back at somebody because mm -hmm. if you're berated enough, I mean, that, that's just a normal human response to that. So that would be, I mean, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that you need to continue with the duration of an interview if somebody's just being completely mm -hmm. disrespectful and rude. Um, if you can finish it, to a degree finish it but not if you're not if you're being that being made that uncomfortable it's just mm -hmm. not there's no point to that 
Uh, do you have any final wisdom for job searchers right now? Oh, final wisdom. I, I mean, you asked really good questions. Um, you know, be honest and be positive. I think that's the, the best way to approach almost any interview question. Um, I see, I think I, trend wise from a questions perspective, I see a lot more recruiters going with behavioral based interview questions, which is tell me how you've done this in the past or how you've reacted in the past. If you haven't approached that situation in the past, just be honest with them. Or if there's something similar, you know, if they're asking about leadership experience and you don't have any professionally, but personally you were the captain of a team or something like that, mm. you, I would be honest. I would say, you know, professionally, I don't have experience there, but this is how I've applied it in my personal life. Um, but being prepared to answer questions like that, um, I think that's, that's probably the main things that I would say. And then, um, Going back to LinkedIn, this is a trend that I'm starting to see where the pictures are a little bit more Facebook-like and a little less professional. If you can't afford headshots or your company doesn't do them because headshots are not cheap, um, my recommendation is one day at work, take a selfie or have a coworker take a picture of you behind a plain colored or in front of a plain colored wall and use that as your picture. Just because I've seen pictures with beer in it, I've seen pictures with, you know, from a night out where maybe the clothes weren't the most professional. And, you know, that just kind of throws you off for a loop because LinkedIn is meant to be a professional tool. So I would advise to err on the side of being a little bit more professional, not putting, you know, super personal stuff up there. Um, I don't need to know that you're married with 17 kids and, you know, you live in whatever, whatever. I'm really more concerned about, can you do the job? You know, and I don't want to be distracted by you doing a keg stand in your picture, which I have seen. Um, fine for Facebook. Let's keep it off LinkedIn. But other than that, not really. I mean, I, the best advice I ever got was be nice and smile. I mean, that was, I was so nervous. My first job interview, I had like my mom's like pearl necklace and a sh suit on to be a pill counter at like the local townie pharmacy and, and, you know, be nice and smile was the advice that I got. And that was, that carried me through a lot of it. So yeah, I think that's it. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs>